Welcome to MindShift. I'm Brandon. Today's episode 18 of our secular Bible study series in which we focus on Job. This feels like a big one. I am tempted to just get rid of all the structure, forget the seven points, and let me tell you everything that is wrong with Job and every single apologetic point that is completely ridiculous. But that is not what secular Bible study is for. Job is also a personal one to me. This was my favorite book of the Bible when I was a believer. In fact, it was my first tattoo, Job 121, right here, right on top of the arm. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. I was all in. Other Christians saw Job and saw it for the issues it had and were questioning God's perfect justice and plan, etc., even though they still believed, but not Brandon. Brandon was making excuses for it. I was on the front line of God made us. God can do whatever he wants. It is my job to be grateful and thankful for anything that he might choose to bless me with. And if he only blesses me with curses, which would be cursing, I guess, then who am I to argue? So I understand how people defend this book. I understand how people take meaning from this book. And now with the clarity of understanding that this God is not real, and if he were, he is not good, I can call a spade a spade and hopefully walk you through this book from a secular perspective. So let's get into point one book overview and talk about what happens in this book. Now, a few things to note, this is a longer book than what we've been going through with the exile books. This is 42 chapters. This is more akin to what we're going to see for the wisdom literature in the Bible. And that's how it's grouped up here. We have Job, we have Psalms, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes are the main four that get considered wisdom literature. And then some of those are poetic and there's other books of the Bible that are poetic, but not wisdom. And so we have these segments here, but Job is probably the oldest book in the Bible. Chronologically, this tale would come first. There is much debate about if this is a actual person and these events actually happened, or if this was a story, a narrative written for the metaphor and the wisdom that can be gleaned from it. I obviously am in the camp of this never happened, and this was a story that man made up to try to deal with the unfairness of life and reconciling a perfect God within that suffering. But even amongst Christian believers, some believe it actually happened and some believe that it did not. This is just a story about a man and his family and his friends and his eventual downfall at the behest of God and Satan, and we'll talk about all of this, his questioning of that suffering, God getting to monologue about who he is and how powerful he is, and then rewarding Job in the end. That's the short version. The slightly longer version is this. The book starts off telling us about Job, who he is, where he's from, and most importantly, that he is blameless. Now, there's a lot of words that get described to Job based off different translations. Blameless, upright, righteous, perfect. Literally, all these words are somewhat interchangeable. There's a lot of connotation that would go into these. In fact, in Inspiring Philosophies video, he goes on to point out how Abraham was made righteous by faith, but Job is just doing good works. And he tries to make the separation that even though Job is called a good man, he had some heart issues. What I would point out immediately is despite whatever word is used or how it's translated here, blameless, perfect, righteous, etc., we are told Job does no wrong. You can't be blameless and then also have a heart issue. You can't be found perfect in the eyes of God, but still have incorrect motives, right? This is the beginning of the apologetics that, okay, he's perfect by works, but God looks at the heart. No, that's not what this book is saying. This book is saying straight up, we've got a perfect dude. I think that's important to kind of get out there. And Satan goes before the Lord because apparently this was a thing. Now, as a side note, there's a lot of debate. Satan is a word that is often translated here or the Satan, the Satan. Sometimes the word accuser is used. And there are all kinds of issues we could get into with, is this the same as Lucifer? Is this the fallen angel? Is this just an accuser in heaven, like a defense lawyer kind of a deal? Like, what is this? Who is this? Most Bibles will translate it as Satan. And most of that is for us to believe it's the same character that is the devil. This video is not to get into that line of theology. This video is simply to talk about Job. So we have this accuser, we have this Satan, we have this devil, and apparently he gets to just go to heaven. He gets called up with others. He's just one of many that are in the court of God, and they're having their usual briefing and meeting. It sounds like this happens often, and yet we never hear about it ever again. For a God that never changes and is completely immutable, we would still imagine that these kinds of happenings happen to Today, but we'll leave that alone for a minute. And in the course of their conversation, God is bragging about Job. God feels the need to brag to this entity, whatever it is, about how good this human is. And Satan convinces God that he is only good because 
God protects him, which is interesting because we know that God's protection and blessing only happens, according to the entire rest of the Old Testament, as a blessing for the work that is done. The accuser here is trying to make the case, and many apologetics will make the case, that Job has gone untested, that he has been rewarded unnecessarily. That's the setup here. That doesn't make any sense. So apparently this accuser made a great point, and God's like, yeah, well, let's find out. Even though I'm omniscient, let's go ahead and cause a ton of suffering. And he gives complete permission to Satan to go and destroy Job's things including his children. So Satan goes and kills his children, his servants, his livestock, etc., to the point where his wife is coming and cursing Job, saying, oh, are you still going to have your integrity now? Curse God and die. And Job says, I will not. And chapter one ends with Job being found still sinless. That's the word that is used here. So as we get into the future parts of this video where we talk about how unjustified this suffering is, I want you to hear it right here, Job 1, 22. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Two different things, by the way. We won't go this slow for each chapter, but the setup is important. So then in chapter 2, Satan once again comes before the Lord. And I want to read you the verbiage so you can understand. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. So again, this is just something that happens. And Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And so now they have another conversation and he's like, see, my dude is still perfect, still perfect, still sinless. And Satan says, oh, it's because you haven't let me hurt him. As if any father who loses all their children and still remains sinless is going to all of a sudden sin when he gets some infliction upon himself. It's so ridiculous. Ridiculous. But now God gives Satan permission to go and mess with Job because previously he was off limits. He can't kill him, but he can do everything else. Tortures him endlessly on every single part of his body. That's chapter two. Chapter three, his friends come. And this is like the bulk of it. It is Job having conversations with his friends who have conversations with each other and then back to Job. And there's three huge cycles of this. And really what we're hearing is the wisdom of the day. We're hearing how people viewed God and it's really interesting because the main concept, there's so much that happens here and I'm doing this so much injustice by not going through like chapter by chapter with these arguments between them. But the main thing is these friends cannot believe that God is doing anything wrong. So therefore, Job must not actually be perfect. That's like the whole thing. They're like, Job, surely you have messed up. Surely you are secretly sinning. And Job's like, no, I'm perfect, which I know sounds whatever, but if you are perfect, I guess that's something you get to say. Also funny that Job Job has made it this far in his life being sinless, and we're told that no one can be sinless. I guess that's a contradiction for later, though. So something that I want to point out here as Job is continuing to petition his perfection, again, not an egotistical thing. He really knows that he has not committed any atrocities against God. He is obviously familiar with this God and this God's rules. Both him and God agree he has not done anything wrong with them. So Job is forced, and he doesn't want to, you can see the fight against this. He is forced to conclude one of two things. Either God isn't just or doesn't care about justice, or worse, God is actually evil. And again, he doesn't want to arrive at these conclusions, but there's nothing else one can assume or conclude. Every preacher I've ever heard, it's at this point in the story where they start pointing out Job's lack of faith, Job's thinking he can do a better job, all of these horrendous things. It's like, no, this is so simple. You have a God who says, who he is, who blesses or curses based off you doing the right thing or the wrong thing. We have no Jesus. We have no savior. We have no grace. We have no new covenant. These are old school laws. This is how God operates. So if you have done everything right and you are getting the punishment as if you did something wrong, this is all you can think. Like, I think this is one of the most important things to understand about the story. Job's friends are wrong. They are guessing that he's done something wrong because they are also under the same assumption. If you had actually done everything right, you'd continue to be blessed. You are being cursed. Therefore, you had to have done these things wrong because that's what this God says he will do. So his friends and Job have 
the correct understanding of God. They have different ideas about why it's happening. So this goes on for a while. He is demanding, finally, God, answer me, tell me. But before we get God's big answer, we get this weird visitor, right? He doesn't show up in Job's initial group of friends. His name starts with El, which is kind of this little play into God. It's a very Israelite name. Elihu is this individual who comes up. He is saying, listen, listen, I've got a different take for you. Maybe God is punishing you because he wants you to learn something, right? Maybe, yes, you are indeed righteous. You are indeed perfect. I'll give you that. But maybe God is doing this as a warning. Maybe you weren't going to continue to be. Maybe God is doing this for you, right? And all we're seeing here, by the way, is all the different ways that man has grappled with unjust suffering. It's me. That's Job's friend's take. It's God. That's Job's take or Elihu's take. It's God, but it's also for you. You can still trust him. This is still overall going to work out, which I don't care what you say. The second a God I really believe in kills one of my children on purpose, nothing's going to work out, especially if I'm of the belief system that I don't deserve it and God knows I don't deserve it. There's nothing that's going to compensate. So again, it's it's a very strange thing when this extra friend comes in and gives his little dialogue about God and yeah, I don't know what's going on with you, Job, and I don't know exactly why, but hey, here's a bunch of other things you can think about. Very Mike Winger apologetics, and I'm picking on him because I just did that video on hell where Mike just suggests as facts things that might be going on in hell that would make it just. That's like what Elihu is doing here. Hey, I don't know. And yeah, okay, you are perfect, but maybe God would be orchestrating it like this and maybe we could excuse him because of that. Gross. But let's move on. I'm going to hop in the Bible here because I want to make sure that I'm covering everything that I'm supposed to. I mean, that happens from like chapter three all the way until I want to say like 37 or 38. Sorry. Okay, 37 is when Elihu comes and then 38 is the Lord answers Job. I just want you to picture the mythology here. There's a whirlwind just going constantly as God speaks directly to Job. And I just want to cut straight to point seven. He talks so sarcastically, so belittling, which is the whole point. We're making Job small and God big. This whole book should have just been called Might Makes Right. I'll do whatever the hell I want because that's all we're getting here. He's questioning Job's intelligence. You don't even know how mountain goats give birth. Like, it's so funny and so man-made, the things that they think would make God sound all knowledgeable. We'll talk about it in point seven, though. I digress. So he just goes on. He's just berating Job. Finally, by chapter 40, Job's like, okay, like, I'm going to cover my mouth now. I'm not going to talk back again. Who am I to do so? And that's not good enough for God. He just doubles down. He's like, I can't believe you would question me. Do you want to try this? Huh? Do you want to be me? Like he's literally talking like this. Then he gets to the whole Leviathan and behemoth thing. I don't want to get into this. This is a part of the book. There are many different thoughts on what these represent. The saddest part is when Christians try to use this to talk about how dinosaurs were still around at this time. I think the most obvious answer is that these would have been kind of folklore of the time. And so they were put into this. Like if this same thing was written in China, I'm sure they would have been talking about dragons. If this was written in South America, they would have been talking about a great sea serpent, which I guess this kind of is as well. But anyways, take it however you want. As literal, mythical, or metaphorical as you want it, doesn't really matter. It's just God still boasting about his greatness, which such a man may think to boast about the big animal you made. If you were really the god of the cosmos, maybe you would talk about planets or galaxies when you're trying to show how much more you know than this guy instead of kind of that really big creature that may or may not exist. So this goes on for a few chapters. And then in 42, we get Job's confession and repentance. And everything that God said worked. It humbled Job It brought him low. The abuse has taken, and now we are subserving again. And it's weird here because Job kind of gets a little bit of a, but you did okay, buddy, from God really being told that he was still right to question. In fact, 7 in chapter 42, the Lord rebukes Job's friends about how they did it incorrectly and that they were too simple to understand that they wouldn't even wrestle with it. But Job did. But it's only like Job wrestled with it because God was torturing him. And then it ends with the sickest part of it all, that the Lord restores Job's fortunes, which we will talk about in point seven. So that's the overview. That's what 
happens. Let's glide through the next few points. Authorship and date. We don't know, we don't know. <laughs> it's old. Some people still put it in the post-exile period. Some people say it was written during the time of the first patriarchs. Some people say even earlier. This book is just pure mystery and it's not supposed to give us this. You know, I'll move right into point three, historical accuracy, background context, etc. Like other than the tribes that the friends come from, we have just nothing we have got the name Uz or Uz, and we've got the ethnicity of the friends, but there is nothing else to compare this up against. So points two and three are going to be really bare here. The point of this book is philosophy. The point of this book is theodicy and theology. It might be purposely vague on those details so that we can focus on the meaning and the message of it. And that's fine. What we can talk about is point four, literary analysis. First of all, even though it's still considered a wisdom book, it is mainly comprised of poetry. And even though it's considered poetry, it still has a lot of a narrative framework. A lot of people, when they think of poetry, they think of actual like stanza poetry, or they think about even a biblical version of poetry would be more like Psalms. But this is true poetry, but again, with an actual story and narrative driving forward of linear events. It's also very dialogue heavy, even within that poetry, the conversations between Job and his friends. We get a lot of speeches. We get speeches from Job. We get speeches from God. We get speeches speeches from Elihu and a lot of monologuing along with all those dialogues and in the midst of them. So pretty unique for a book of the Bible so far. Again, we are going to get some other wisdom literature, but I don't think there's really anything like Job. It is such a standout on its own. Point five, in terms of main themes, it's obvious, but the first one is a theodicy, which deals with the problem of evil and the justice of God. We're going to be talking about this pretty much for the rest of the time in point seven, so I'm not going to get too much into this theme. It's kind of obvious. Two is the nature of suffering. So if we're working out that this is somehow okay. We can map this onto God somehow in a excusable and justifiable way. Where does suffering come from? Why do we suffer? Who should suffer? Is there an amount of suffering that is correct? Is there a tipping point within suffering? Should one suffer for their sins? Should one learn from their suffering? All of these things are addressed and, and really Job is the book of suffering. A third theme I might get from this is the limitation of knowledge or the purpose of knowledge. How much can we know? How much should we know? What rights do we have in lieu of ultimate knowledge? What certainty can we attain and should we attain any certainty? And within that, if you wanted to sprinkle in another thing, we could talk about fairness in general. That's a little different than the necessity of suffering as well as divine justice. So lots and lots of stuff going on in this book. It is a wonderful book for philosophers. It is a wonderful book for the theologian and the apologist. Finally, for point six, we have a lot to talk about. Point Six is reception and influence. What hasn't this book affected? This is considered one of the greatest works of ancient literature ever. This has been borrowed and taken from left and right. Let's see, you have John Milton's Paradise Lost. You have Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov that deals with the same kind of theodicies. We have even Herman Melville's Moby Dick, where Ahab is dealing with the same sort of existentialist questioning. Just in philosophy in general, Nietzsche is dealing with this kind of stuff. Camus, Sartre, all of them pinpoint back to stories in Job as they make their case for these existential questions. From religious standpoint, points, you have Judaism, which is looking at the story of Job as hey, hands off, like God's knowledge is unattainable to us. And God's sovereignty is perfect despite our limited understanding. Where the Christians take Job is really a precursor to the New Testament, the need for a better plan, the need for a personal savior through Jesus, something that can vindicate and validate the suffering of this world, a compensation that will come with eternal life. See, in Job's world, the compensation has to happen with getting double blessings, more servants, more children, more possessions, etc. But with the introduction to salvation through Jesus Christ, we're compensated for our earthly suffering in general with the next life. Compensation is a huge part of all of this, and it is, again, I think the most egregious. The reception influence go on and on through music and visual art and media and paintings, etc. Like it is everywhere. Even the references to Leviathan, like Thomas Hobbes or the behemoth, etc. It's again, it's infiltrated our entire world because it's so relatable, because people have had these questions forever and will have them forever. It's just at what point do you wake up and say it doesn't work? 
with a tri-omni God. That's why no one has been able to give it a satisfactory answer. But all of this is exactly what we would expect in a naturalistic world. It's so very, very simple. We just can't let go of our myths, and so we have to find a way to continue to make them map onto our world. And they don't. With that being said, let's get into point seven, contradictions and problematic passages. Where do I begin? Honestly, it's almost paralysis by analysis here. There's so very much we could go through. It's such a strange book of the Bible. We get opposite answers than we see from everywhere else in the Bible. Is God omniscient? This book has God asking questions that he genuinely seems not to know the answers to. Does God always punish evil? This book seems to give answers that contradict what the rest of the Bible says. Is the devil bound by God? Or is he free to roam the earth? Does the devil have to ask for permission before every single thing he does? Or has the earth been given to him and his jurisdiction and he can do anything he wants? We see different sides of this if we look at Job versus anywhere else in the Bible. Has there been a just person or not? Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned. Well, Job was real. Job didn't sin. Will God just curse everyone until they sin to make that true? We never even get an admittance from God that Job did anything wrong. God being mad at Job is not the same as Job sinning. Job is told at the beginning that he's perfect. He's told after the initial calamities happened that he still has not sinned. And he's told by God in the end, he was never wrong for wrestling and grappling. What did Job do wrong? If Job never messed up, doesn't he inherit salvation immediately by works? It's only because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God that we need a savior. There are so many questions that arise from this. So many issues with this theology. Can God do anything or is God bound by certain things? Who brought evil on Job? Was it Satan or was it God? Should we fear God? We're told not to be afraid of anything, but we're told here that the beginning of wisdom is fear. Job says he used to just hear God, but he says, now I see God. I thought no one could see God, even though this has already been broken in other contradictions in previous books. Despite what I said earlier about the metaphor of Behemoth and Leviathan, they are talked about factually from God's mouth as him creating them and them actually existing. Where were they on the ark? Where are they now? But a lot of these, again, like always, are not hills I want to die on. I think that they're, depending on how much you want to bend the scripture, are ways to explain them away, not to offer good, valid justifications for them. But let's talk about some of these verses. I think the first one I want to hit happens actually in the first chapter. In verse 22, chapter 1, in all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. I just want to point this out one more time as an inexcusable reason, according to the own rules of God, to purposely inflict Job with a curse. And that is what this is. God allowing Satan to go and do these things was a curse. The same kind of curse that God says he only does as punishment for sin. And yet, in all these things, Job did not sin. And then, you know, I'm hesitant to even cover the most obvious, but in Job 2, 3, And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still holds fast his integrity, although you incite me against him to destroy him without reason. From the mouth of God himself, after he's already killed Job's children, taken his property, murdered innocent people. Well, God didn't really kill them. Satan did under God's allowance. And I'm just going to skip to this and then we're going to come back. Let's go to chapter 42 really quick because I want to get this out of the way. This is verse 11. Then come to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before and ate bread with him in his house. And they showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. God is the one who brought evil upon him. This is not the only verse. Again, I quote Isaiah all the time where God boasts about creating evil. It doesn't get any more clear than this. No apologetics needed. No excuses needed. God knows there's no reason to do this. God gives in to Satan's temptation. The lame line you hear all the time is to win a bet. I'll be better than that. I'll say to prove God's worth, right? Obviously, God is getting value here out of having made someone that is perfect. If God takes value from this, if this is how we can impress Satan, which apparently is important to God, God's batting record is the worst record in the history of time. Because other than Job and Jesus, who was God, no one else has ever not sinned. Think about that for a second. So chapter 38 is where the Lord answers Job. Verse 1, then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, 
Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you and you will make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? or who laid its cornerstone. It goes on and on and on, and and it gets into some parts like this. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow, or have you seen the storehouses of the hail? Like, one thing I won't get into too much here is that God gives some descriptions here of how nature and the world works that are clearly, at best, metaphorical, at worst, ignorant and incorrect. It's almost funny that this is a book that is clearly written by man trying to tell man how little man knows by boasting about how much God knows only to have God get things incorrect or have a limited conception of them. Let's add some irony to the literary analysis of this book. Granted, I understand this can be talked about in metaphor. If you were the creator of the universe and you wanted to say you had a storehouse for hail, you could do that. It wouldn't be very logical. It wouldn't make very much rational sense. Seems like you might want to talk about the water cycle instead and how temperature affects molecules of certain different atomic arrangement, etc. But nope, we have storehouses where we keep our hail and storehouses where we keep our snow. And I put it out depending on what I'm feeling it has nothing to do with all of the science and weather going on. I think it's also a good time to point out the sarcasm with which our Lord is speaking. That may not be a big deal for some people, but this makes God look very petty and very small. If he created everything and then he created Job and created the limitations in Job to not know these things. Why berate him like this? I understand the whole point is that he's trying to prove a point of how knowledgeable he is and how stupid Job is. Therefore, Job has no right to question. But right there is where I want to draw the line. Job does have a right to question. In fact, I answered this as well, why we have the right to question God, even if we don't know everything. There are things we can observe. There are things we are told we can know. The next example that God gives is, do you know when the mountain goats give birth? (laughs) Okay, so Job doesn't know that, but Job does know God's promise to bless for righteousness and curse for wickedness. And he knows he's been righteous and he knows he's getting cursed. See, these are things Job can know. And thus, then Job can and should question in his creator, the creator of those rules, the arbiter of that. Of course he has a right to. This is the black or white fallacy that so many apologists do. You can't know everything, thus you know nothing. Wrong. We know some things, and some things are enough. What a dumb get out of jail free card for God. Maybe you disagree, but I think it's important here to just kind of read God speaking for himself on the problem of suffering and justice. We all question it all the time, and yet included in our canon is God doing it. In chapter 40, verse 3, Job promises silence. Then Job answered the Lord and said, this is after all that stuff about nature, behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once and I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. He's telling God, I get it. God's not done though. Listen to this for a little bit. In verse 8, will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be in the right? Have you an arm like God? And can you thunder with a voice like his? Adorn yourself with majesty and dignity, clothe yourself with glory and splendor, pour out the overflowings of your anger and look on everyone who is proud and abase him and tread down the wicked where they stand. Hide them all in the dust together, bind their faces in the world below. Then will I acknowledge to you that your own right hand can save you. I'm going to go on here, but what God is saying is how he commands justice. He's saying that he goes around and watches everyone, that he pours out overflowings of his righteous anger. Once again, we have God admitting to Job, see, every time people do wrong, I go around and I do bad things to them. Can you do that? That's Job's whole point. If you know I'm sinless, why are you doing it to me too? So what a dumb answer from God. And poor Job just has to bite his tongue right now. It's right after this that he talks about behemoth and then he talks about Leviathan and I'm not going to get into all the issues there. And I want you to hear a broken down Job in chapter 42. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? knowledge. Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust 
and ashes. This is what God wanted to hear. This is why God now stops his tirade. What was the end goal? Not just to have Job know God, not just to have heard about the things God can do, but now he's seen for himself. It wasn't until he said, I now despise myself. We have all these beautiful ideas about what repentance is, a change of heart, mind, and direction, as other parts of the Bible put it. But here, repentance is summed up as, therefore, I despise myself and repent. And God is satisfied. Tell me again, you don't have an abusive relationship with this God that will tell you he only does wicked things as punishment to wicked people, and then clearly does wicked things as punishment to righteous people or innocent people. And if you call him out on it, how wrong you are when the correct position is not to despise God, but to despise yourself. And by the way, this plays out all the time because this is the posture one has to take to serve a God like that. The video I did about the 20 examples and the 200 verses where God does not uphold his own objective morality, the main comment from Christians, again, is who am I to judge? God's ways are higher. God created us so he can do whatever he wants. This is a position of despising yourself. But again, Again, that is the posture one has to take. It's disgusting. A problematic verse right here is 42, 7. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said, My anger burns against you, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. What did his friends say about God that was incorrect? They said, God is perfect. God is just. Therefore, it must be you who have sinned. And so what does he have the friends do? Therefore, take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves. And my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly. For you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. Doubling down again. And so, okay, here we just have the creator of the universe who just got done bragging about all the wonderful things he made that, again, I would love to point out. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how much we would be forced to believe in this God if in the oldest book of the Bible, during God's huge bragging tirade, he talked about the galaxy that we are a part of, the spiral nature to it, and how many planets orbit our particular solar system with the sun he put in the sky. Can you imagine the indisputable proof we would have? Can you imagine if he talked about what temperature that rain became hail and snow, how he orchestrated that? Can you imagine if he talked about the subatomic world and how every Everything is made of these small collections of particles, some of which have electrical charge, some of which have minus that charge, and some of which have no charge. Can you imagine that? The thing is, is this God doesn't brag about anything that man at that time did not know about. I could give you a million more examples that God easily could have, would have, and should have done if he were real and actually all-powerful. But instead, we have a very lowly God who loves the scent of burning flesh from these wonderful, majestic creatures that he created and knows so much about, that even though there's no recognizable sin by Job's friends, they are condemned to his awful punishment unless they can make a sacrifice to Job now, not to God, which is weird, so that Job will pray for them because God will hear that prayer instead of just, I don't know, forgiving them on his own. Like all we see is back to all this ritual, ridiculous, man-made structure of how to appease the gods. You know what would have been cool is at the end of that huge tirade, he also said, but I'm a God of grace. Let me show you. Nope, he's still got a vengeance. The debts still have to be paid, even though when you don't have a debt, you also still have to pay it. And we'll end with, again, what I think is part of the most egregious of this all, and this is what every single pastor, preacher, and apologist I've ever heard hangs their hats on. Here comes God's grace, actually, Brandon. You were wrong. Verse 10. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends, and the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. And the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 female donkeys, seven sons and three daughters. And all the daughters were so beautiful. And their father gave them an inheritance among the brothers. Of course, the only value is how pretty the women are. And it ends like this. And after this, Job lived 140 years and saw his sons and his son's sons for four generations. And Job died an old man full of days. Because that is the conceptual human idea of blessing. That's the success story, right? I suffer through Yahweh's ridiculous, unnecessary suffering and vengeance, and look what I got. Double. Hot daughters and rich sons. What more could a man want? Let me grow old and see everything that I have created prosper 
and die happy. Forget the conflict that happened between me and my wife. Forget the mental distress of losing all of our previous children. Forget the innocent blood in my fields of the slaves and servants God killed to make a point. I've got a thousand female donkeys. Really, the sickness here comes down to the children. A God that would kill innocent children of the only righteous man that has ever lived is a God that will do whatever he wants. You want to learn something from Job? Learn this. You're not better than Job, according to God, and your children are not more innocent than Job's. There doesn't have to be a great lesson. There doesn't have to be a punishment. There doesn't have to be a sin in your life. If it suits God for any reason, any whim, he can and will do whatever he wants to you, and you better not say boo about it. Unless you lower yourself to the point that you despise yourself, you do not have the correct reaction to God's infliction on you. And if God chooses to make things right, it will be to compensate you in this life or the next. Imagine this not being a God. Imagine this being a man that comes to your house, burns it down, that kills your employees, that finds the room all your children are in and knocks all the walls down to crush them to death. He then grabs a syringe and puts all the worst diseases into you, all the ones that won't kill you, but will make you suffer every kind of suffering imaginable. And after you've suffered, and only if you have learned the lesson that he is better than you, and you tell him, you were right. I was wrong. I despise myself. He says, hey, here's some more kids and I built you a new house and I hired you a better and newer workforce. You're going to be rich, man. And you're going to be able to leave some inheritance to your sons. We cool? Would you be cool? Would that compensation make it okay? No. So why would it make it okay if God does it? It doesn't. So we didn't learn a lesson. There is no answer to suffering. My fun secret theory is that Job is actually a book by the atheist pointing out that there is no good reason that suffering happens here on earth other than natural causes. That clearly there can't be this from a good, all-knowing, all-benevolent God. If you can read the story of Job, hear God's defense of his actions, and still believe him to be a good God that you can trust and that you should worship, I would beg you to reconsider. It does not get more obvious than this. That's all I have to say for today. In the future, probably hopefully soon, I will do a thorough debunking on the sick apologetics of this book that other people have made so we can address those claims one by one. But here is course one for you on the problems with the book of Job and what they really say about this God. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. And until next time, keep thinking. I wanted to personally thank my top three tiers of support. First is the Iconoclast tier with GVI Precision Body and Paint, Jason Rollins, Oliver, and Sean Skaggs. Also my Atheist Advocate tier, Elijah Jeffrey, Jared Nichols, Christy Goff, and Sparky. And lastly, a huge shout out to all of my Secular Scholar tier patrons. If you like what I'm doing on this channel or you believe in my mission, please consider supporting as well. Thanks and have a wonderful day.